West. I'm Jennifer Seiner. I'm the MC. Thank you for being here. Uh, Helicon West is an uncensored public reading series. We regularly host published authors alongside community writers to promote and support all levels of skill, ability, and craft. If you would like to read during the open mic, which is the only thing happening tonight, so <laughs> if you don't read, we have nothing to look at. So uh, if you want to read during the open mic, you can sign up on the sheet, which is right here. Okay. Uh, let's see, if you want to donate to keep Helicon West going, we have bookmarks on the coffee table with a QR code link. True or false? Yes. True. They're on this table. No, that table. Sorry. We acknowledge that Helicon West operates on the territory of the Northwestern Band of the Shoshone Nation. Our events are made possible with support from Sugar House Review, the Logan Library, the USU English Department, and community volunteers. For our full land acknowledgement statement, interviews with featured readers, merch. Do we have merch? Mm -hmm. Excellent. And Through more. Sugar House Review. Yeah. Right. Merch. Visit Helicon West. It's uh, heliconwest.wordpress.com. Bang Gunsberg's graduate students will be here next Thursday. They are reading um, in their series is called Poetry and Technicolor, I think. Yeah. Is that it? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So um, especially if you're interested in becoming a graduate student in our program, which I know several of you in this audience are considering, you might want to come and see what the graduate students are doing. So that's next. Thursday, which is an odd Thursday. Normally it would be the fourth Thursday. That's Thanksgiving, so it's the third Thursday here in this lovely place. Any questions? Concerns? <laughs> Anyone have anything they want to offer <laughs> besides your beautiful work in a minute? We're good? Okay. So it is all open mic all the time. It's not on my MC sheet, but I do know that if you do not want... Oh no, there is something to say right here. And now for our open mic. Each reader will have up to seven minutes to read. After seven minutes, they will be politely clapped off. If you do not wish to be recorded, that's the part I wanted to say, for our YouTube archive, please tell us before you read, and then we'll just turn the camera off, okay? All right, we're gonna start the first three readers, which are Cade, then Emily, KJ. Way to go, students, for showing up. <laughs> all right, welcome to you all. Hello, I'm Cade, and I have a poem that I wrote actually for Shen's class. Yeah. Yeah. My favorite poem. <laughs> yeah. uh, this is a poem called Mightier. A sword's teeth are mightier than the tongue of a pen. So says an imbecile to a scholar. The pen is a needle from which the world is sewn, says a coward to a warrior. Actions speak louder than words, but spoken words lead to action, to violence, to peace, to absolutely nothing at all. Mightier is the hand that knows when to grasp a pen and when to grasp a sword. Emily, you good? I would not like to be recorded. Just Got it. Oh, Joseph. This is a draft of a poem titled Stained Glass Smile. The sun sipped on my skin like rosemary wine, rice paper pale blush complexion, scraped knees, smiles stretched as I lean into mom's arms. I grasped the photo frame till knuckles turned bone white. Mother always braided my hair, pink bows tied at the ends, and she always turned broken moments into stained glass smiles. This image of me in her arms, you can see fear in her eyes about how to raise a child as a child, only 16 when I was born. I lean into her embrace when I want to hide from the world, yet she has become the fragile one now, grasping for moments while poison keeps her breathing, a small chance for a little more life. So I braid her thin hair and I lie with her in bed while she tells me stories of us in years past. I wish I could tell you that it gets easier to become the nurturer for her who nurtured us. My inner child gets quieter the older I get and I can't remember the last time I felt at home. But I see her and mom stand at glass smiles and in her eyes paper pale skin as I help her slip on her knitted sweaters with a knock on the door. I put down the photo frame with a tight smile, yet another dinner brought that was sour in the fridge with the others. I no longer tie loose ends with pink ribbons, but somewhere in between then and now, I learned how to braid like mom did. And when I mourn for the future I won't have with her, I grasp for comfort and calm memories 
of a childhood filled with stained glass smiles. Thank you to Kate, Emily, and KJ. Next we have Woody. Woody, can I call you Woody? Is yeah, yeah. Woodrow. No, I, just, yeah, I write it different every now and then. Okay, I just wanted to make sure. Okay. Woody, Amber, and then it's probably Ellie. Is it Ellie? Eli. Eli. Sorry, Eli. Then Eli. What are your oh, odds? <laughs> um, like 95% of this was written well before any like actual training. <laughs> so bear with me. Um, but this is from uh, the second chapter of a novel I'm working on. But the first chapter is like currently chopped up into like a thousand pieces. So this is the only readable section. <laughs> okay. Um, as the Medusa clo pulls closer to land, a city comes into view. The port town she aims for is on the southeasternmost coast of the continent. Its docks are located on the southeasternmost corner of the city, making it an ideal point to conduct immigration from, the, uh, from outside countries. Drawing closer to these docks, Shen's jaw goes slack as he sees the largest structure he's ever encountered. The bricks of the fortress wall stack a colossal 125 feet tall and circle the entire city. Above the, <clears throat> above the steel gates at the end of the docks, carved in massive letters, is the title Riftshade. The sign is readable from far out at sea. Up to this point, the largest thing that Shen has ever seen is an especially large, an especially old evergreen tree in his home country. Some of the letters on the sign rivaled that tree's size, leaving Shen completely baffled. He lets out an almost silent wow and turns to his companion. He asks, have you ever seen anything like this? I have, she responds full of contempt. Well, what's the matter? Only men build fortresses of stone. I expected something different than this, something more green than gray. It's so unnatural. Let us conduct our business here and be done with this place quickly. Shen is quick to pick up on her unease, and soon his, his sword hand is subconsciously gripping his sword. Yes, my lady, by the way, what is our business here? I wish to learn more of this land and the events that have passed since men came here. Uh, we must learn where the elves can be found, for now that's our purpose. Something tells me we won't find them in this rift shade. There should be a place inside these walls with the information we seek. I'm getting super embarrassed, so I'm gonna stop there. Oh, <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. I'm like crazy. covered in sweat. I'm yeah. so nasty. Just kidding. I haven't done anything yet. Okay, I'm sorry. sorry. Okay. Um, <laughs> Shen notes his companion's persistent vagueness, but has become accustomed to and even fond of it. Her unease, on the other hand, is something new. The hair on the back of his neck stands on end. As, as mighty a fighter as he was, anything that made her afraid, oh, that's a goofy sentence right there. <laughs> as a true warrior, he welcomed a challenge. He smiles again, eyebrows narrowing, and looks towards the city. The crew of the Medusa has begun running around, preparing for the docking process. Captain Darris has begun barking commands from the helm. Lower the sails, lads, prepare drop anchor. Crew members run back and forth across the deck, hauling lines. Above Shen and Midori, the sails slowly inch upward on a pulley system into a bundle. The ship must slow to a stop approaching the docks. A sailing ship as large as the Medusa can't be tied directly to the docks, so she's anchored offshore. Once close enough, Captain Doris continues. Drop anchor and prepare to lower the dinghy. A strong-looking man behind Shen and Midori throws a large chunk of metal carved into the shape of a coiled snake overboard. The rope it was secured to is pulled tight off the back end of the stern, and at the same time, eight other crew members grab and lift the dinghy over their heads. The captain inspects the anchor rope and, once satisfied, turns to the main deck and yells, Lower her down, lads, we ain't got all day. At his prompting, the men slowly lower the vessel down the side of the Medusa with ropes. Two of the crew members are inside the boat on its voyage to the water. Once they land, they begin to paddle the short distance to the docks. They tow a line from the Medusa to, cert to fully secure it to said docks. Along with the pair of passengers, Captain Doris turns to Midori and Shen. He gives her as gentlemanly a smile as he can muster and says, they should be back with a large enough vessel to carry everyone needs bringing. She responds with a silent nod of gratitude for the information and Captain Doris looks away as they have reached the limit of this seafarer's abilities and decorum. Shen watches the dinghy draw closer to the docks for a moment and then turns to Midori. My lady, what do you know of these men? These people outside of Asherano, that's his homeland. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
uh, are different, as I haven't drawn my sword in several nights, but I worry my ignorance will put me at a disadvantage within these walls. Neither of them pulls their gaze away from the monolithic walls, as Midori responds, you are wise in your worries, young one. This would become a nickname of fondness she used for him. The battles we will fight inside Riftshade are far different than those we've encountered so far. There will be some good nestled deep within, but the evil here knows how to imitate good. They will deceive us with their smiles and try to attack us in other ways. Insults, braggeries, lies, temptations, these will be their weapons. Do not let them shake you. We will not require your sword, but that does not mean it won't be useful. They may see it and fear you. Follow my lead and speak when spoken to. This too we will endure and overcome. And now I'm actually <laughs> This is a little poem song I wrote with the idea that it could be like a song that like a cowboy would sing by a campfire. So if you want to just imagine I'm a grizzled cowboy, <laughs> that would really help me. Um, it's called I Seen God. There ain't no cell can hold me. There ain't no fight I'll lose. There ain't no man can best me. I'll never meet the news. She tells me God will cut me down. I've yet to see his face. In all these years, he's never graced this God-forsaken place. But I seen God in mountain pools when I stood at the shore. I stood right there and looked on down, my face the water wore. So you keep your trifle warnings and you take them someplace else. Take them to a man who cares, to someone who it helps. <laughs> I'm Eli, and I'll be reading a uh, poem I wrote last spring called My Corazon Network. Some call the banyan tree powerful with its sh shoots aplenty spr sprouting face first into the floor, slamming into the moss and mud to scoop up the compounds it needs to sustain its blossoms. But I say the banyan is decrepit, desperate, paltry. Don't miss the forest for the trees. It's not the banyan that is powerful. It's a network from tree to tree underneath the ground. They're all entangling each other like a family's embrace. It's a forced together that is strong. But they couldn't be strong if not for the fungus, this mycorrhizae, that binds together their roots. Without mycorrhizae, not a maple, poplar, or pine could slurp enough nutrients to subsist. It is after the fungus that the strength of the forest is named, a mycorrhizal network. So when you cannot breathe, look to the trees and learn. Root over root is how jungles thrive. The elm by the river feeds the thirsty birch woods. And the mighty eucalyptus casting shade is sure to send carbons through the network to feed the adolescents beneath its branches. So lift up your face, let me see your tears, and let me rejoice in your triumphs too. Let our hearts reach out to beat as one, and together we can become mycorrhizal. <laughs> And Eli, the next three readers are Lisa, Ronald Jensen, and Star. So, Lisa. I'm sorry if, if you've already heard this poem, but my friends encouraged me to read it again. Love yes. It. It's called Today's First Snow. Can you hear me? Today's first snow bended the cosmos and frosted the marigolds, turned the cold river dark and dripped from the pines, stripped the trees of their leaves and revealed their black skeletons. Today's first snow melted on the pavement, wet my boots and drove me indoors to contemplate the coming of the season of the inner life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Adjustment system zeros are downwards, which misses in fact to one hundred one hundred of big zeros, which the sound is to relax. The two first are religion and with all the two. Speak out on holidays, Fridays, photos, and nothing else you can do. The four first are dictionaries and the way we talk. The five first are scientists, the camera thing out. 
six months on chain mail and beans while sort. Seven months on the arts and dinosaurs. sport. Three times on drugs and poems and plays. And nine times on the archery and history of past days. We started by archways and people we adore. Just by three four. Hope we're talking more. Yes. <laughs> it's gonna work out. Halloween fun. Fun was gonna be over. Fun will be done. This is Halloween. We can have some fun. <laughs> go put on costumes and go from door to door. Saying stick a tea and getting candy galore. Send me eater teeth to a class content. Then we get back home. At least it's not in town. What fun we'll have? Gonna go out tonight. Right now it's COVID. Giving us a fight. I've been writing short memoir pieces in Sean's front room writing group. And so I have 50 of them now. And this is number 49. And it's um, not like uh, my usual memoirs. It's just a dialogue. So um, that's what it turned out to be anyway when I revised it. And it's called Threes. Hey, Mama. Hello, my girl. How are you today? Well, so you know, Cookie made me go to the ER. I didn't want to. I was bleeding so bad I was passing out. Well, they kept me for a week, detoxed me. I don't even want to look at a bottle of vodka. First time since I was 12. What's that? 41 years. Been through detox three times. Always had a bottle stashed. Not this time. I haven't had a drink in 21 days. So Cookie picked me up at the farm the other day. I don't work there anymore. I quit. But he reaches in the back seat and pulls out this pint, starts waving it in front of my face, says, I found one of your bottles. I said, what the hell? Get that out of my face. He was trying to tell me he found my stash, but I don't do that anymore. I'm sure I didn't put it there recently. I haven't touched any liquor since they made me wait three hours for the fucking ER. Did I send you pictures of all that blood? Yes, you did. Well, it wouldn't stop. They said it was a good thing I got there when I did, or I'd have bled out and died. Wouldn't let me get out of bed for a week. They wanted to do a colonoscopy, but they said there was too much blood and inflammation. Had me hooked up to so many tubes, they had something in every orifice. Fed me detox drugs through my veins. Sent me home with a walker. Well, I quit using it. Just held on to the cabinets and walls. I'm okay now. Just waiting for a colonoscopy and some other tests. Cookie asked me if I wanted a beer the other night, so I tasted one. It didn't do anything for me. They said they could put me on an injection to keep the craving down. Better than the pills. I'm taking a lot of pills anyway. Pain pills, too. I'm only taking what they ordered the way you're supposed to. I don't want to end up like I did when I was on pills with Kip. I couldn't quit. Took me years and damn near killed me. They say how things come in threes, you know? That time I ended up in the hospital, my kidneys and liver nearly shut down. And I was walking home from the farm and that truck hit me, broke my phone, broke my jaw, wrecked my face. I was bruised all over. Did I send you that picture? Yes. <laughs> well, maybe it comes in threes more times for me than others. Uh, I had that ectopic pregnancy, remember, and they took out my ovary and it got so infected they had to take all my insides out. You know, they put them on the table and they wash them one at a time and they put them back in. That was the first time I got sepsis. First time my jaw got broke was when Todd pushed me out of his truck, stomped on my face and left me on the side of the road. Oh, and then I had that kidney and bladder infection and turned septic again. Oh yeah, and I fell off the porch at Robbins and cut my head open. I think I'm done drinking. I don't want any more threes. You know how they say things, things happen in threes and the third one's the charm? Well, I want that fucking charm. <laughs> Does anyone want to set up? 
We're moving on. <laughs> Don't worry, there's time. We're moving on to Brock, Shannon, and Sydney. This is called Swatted. 1-16-22, a.m. McKay D. Hospital SWAT Commander. Target, disheveled white male impersonating absent-minded professor. <laughs> Advanced indeterminate age. Lost and frustrated look of bull stuck in China shop doorway. <laughs> Timeline, enter south door 852. Long black fabric case. From serve cam view, suspect AR-15. <laughs> Frequent pack practice prepares the proud, primes pistons for push comes to shove, ready like a mouse trap, loaded. <laughs> Squad gears up and heads out in 90 seconds, quick stepping hospital first floor hallway. Who would be fool enough to smuggle an unauthorized weapon here? <laughs> Target finds doors from stairs to third floor locked, Sunday. <laughs> to retreats to first floor, headed to the Owen J. Snorter Memorial Cafeteria. Might have to take him out before he can spray bullets at breakfasters like bobbleheads in an arcade, but he diverts to the men's washroom. No matter how many raids notched, no matter how many doors busted open like smashed rotten cantaloupes, any cop gets the willies putting shoulder to door, bracing for a bevy of bullets. Dead without seeing the target like a blind William Tell, but bust the door Barry and Diablo do. Barrels raised, trigger fingers cocked. Target has completed urination procedure. <laughs> Black bag leans against the wall. What's in the bag? The voice of the law is firm, like an elephant's step, leaving no room for equivocation or deceit. Guitar, he answers, trembling. <laughs> Open it. He unzips the case and holds up a long, narrow stringed instrument. Not standard issue, but no threat detected. <laughs> Lay it. He plucks a few notes and feebly stutters the word, misconstrued. Seamless exit. Threat minimized. Citizen cleared to go about his business. <laughs> Marcy. My sister died this past summer. She was 45 years old. Dream about Marcy. I swim in a blue-green lake. Black and gold birds on the shore pick with precise beaks. Black cats with black coots with white bills. They all fly away at once in a burst of feathers black and gold streaks. Marcy swims toward me. She starts to sink. I can touch the bottom. I pull her to the surface and hold her. I know she is going to die in a few days. I hold her pale, freckled face close to mine. I see silver strands in her long, dark hair. I hold her close in the water, in the blue-green water. In the blue-green water, I cradle her, try to shield her from the aching. And this is called digging. I kneel on the hard ground in a drizzle. Clouds hang like gray scarves on mountains. And I frantically claw dirt away. It cakes under my nails from the shallow grave until I see myself, my blue face, a little dirt clinging to my eyelashes, smeared across my cheeks, my long brown hair tangled. 
Tenderly, I brush the dirt from my own eyes and place my lips to my own lips, try to give myself CPR, pound my own chest, breathe warm breath into my cold lungs over and over and over, but I'm too late. Her face, her face, her closed eyes with fine eyelashes, her eyes closed like the deafening long silence after a prayer ends. I grasp her limp hand. I want to be her again. I want to be whole again, but I can't go back. She has been dead for almost two years. I kiss her goodbye. I wake again to my own life, everything shimmering with tears. And this last one is called A New Light. Um, so I suffered, I survived a massive stroke 22 months ago to this day. And so this is called A New Light. I am bringing a candle to this moment when I face my stroke. Try to see it in soft light. The shadows splash the walls, wash them in a gentle bath. I remember my grandmother would wash my hair in the kitchen sink when I was young. Her fingertips massaged the no tears shampoo into my scalp, the gold fragrance rising around me as I lay on the kitchen counter beside the knife block and the bread box beneath the mug with the little figurine of a black cat glued inside so when you you would drink milk the cat would materialize one bit at a time i hope the stroke gets a little better each day so i will see progress like the cat becoming more visible with each sip but i am regressing my toe catches on ragged roots jagged rocks i hold the candle close to better see myself the flames tongue my face, then snatch my hair, catch it on fire. I am burning, burning, burning. I flail my arms, struggle to put myself out, tear at my hair, yank it out by the roots. Now I am in the middle of a bonfire. The soles of my shoes melt. The flames rise in rings around me, trap me in fiery jaws. My skin sizzles in the fry of flames. I smell my flesh burning. I am being eaten alive. Alive I am being devoured. After the flames die, the stroke clings to me like smoke, clings to my skin and hair, infusing everything I do and say. My lips blister, my hair melted, my skin peels off in flaky layers, but I am alive. I must learn to love myself now, learn to grow great white wings and rise. of our love is kind words and quiet morning kisses, quarters clinking like rings on nightstands. You offer to drive long distances because I get drowsy, dimes dancing in your eyes from the moon's reflection after dusk. Nights spent swaying in the kitchen, hearts knit together, your body on mine in need. Nipples fill our pockets, dragging us to the floor. Playlists carefully curated with the other person in mind, pushing play and letting lyrics speak. Pennies roll like melodies, filling our ears. Our tip jar is full of change, tightly packed in glass, and our bank account bursts at the seams, for I'll never be richer than I am when I'm with you. Mm -hmm. This one's called On Display. I don't want to be seen as an object, as disposable as a condom used during the act. I want to go deeper in another way. I want boys to invade my mind, not my body. But it's not their fault that I can't stop undressing, can't stop giving them access, because I was taught to be desirable. 
I saw girls around me seemingly flaunting their hips and breasts and skin, and boys followed them all the way to the very edge of the world, and I wanted that. So I sealed my body in the display case, inviting everyone to get a look, take a picture. But it wasn't long until I felt trapped and that I don't know how to get out. And this one's called Streaks of Anger. My love is a shooting star. He burns brilliantly and chars everything in his path. The itch of waiting till he walks through the door, the stench of liquor flowing from his lips, the bitter taste of the words he screams at me. The floor wraps its arms around me when all he offers are his fists because he loves me and shows his love in peculiar ways. He buries me alive, then cries at my grave when he sees passers-by. There are moments when his light dims, and the shape of him is concrete, he is real. Then his wicked grin returns, and body turns to weapon. The lifeless taste of his mouth on mine, and the sweat dripping from his face convince me I'm not real. The canker sore of a memory pulses in my mouth. A rigid heart clanks in his ghost town of a chest cavity. I feel as safe as him as I do when walking home in the dark. My mama called him a good for nothing and begged, said you have to go, and so I ran. I followed that lonely path of freedom. There's no place like home when home is abandoned. Marianne says he's down in Georgia now. He will die alone and cold and no one will notice the sky is missing a star. The streets will simply fizzle out, blending into black night. This is a draft of an essay for a nature writing class. It's called um, Flash Flood. Sandstone cliffs tower over my family like and I like buildings in New York City as we walk through the Grand Wash in Capitol Reef National Park. Rusty clay rocks beneath our feet. We were at the halfway mark, a section of the wash where the cliffs narrowed when it began to rain. The burnt orange clay turned a deep copper as it thickened. The mark of hot water high up on the on the more than 100 foot cliff made my stomach churn. Capitol Reef is one of the more hidden Utah national parks located in south central Utah in the Colorado Plateau. Its landscape can have abrupt changes in weather during monsoon season, any time of the day, bringing heavy rain and thunderstorms to its mild, miles of colorful canyons and high wild, wild gorges decorated with gleaming apricot globe mallow, a type of desert flower that sometimes appears pink. The Grand Wash cuts through the water pocket fold, a geological feature that runs from Thousand Lakes Mountain, a landmark where stars light up the night sky like the sun, to Lake Powell. It is filled with steep, alluring Navajo and Wingate sandstone cliffs up to 500 feet tall that are painted with everything from wine to crushed violets and leaves of sage. My nine-year-old eyes were glued, and glued to the dazzling, unexpected colors as drops of rain streaked down them. According to the National Park Service, Capitol Reef National Park has some of the most spectacular geology in the western United States. The early Navajo people who utilized the park for thousands of year, years called it the land of the sleeping rainbow. The wash contains sections where walls are less than 15 feet apart. Feet apart. When it rains, water rushes through, covering the entire canyon floor with a prison-filled flood. Despite the gray warnings in the distant sky and advice from a park ranger not to do the hike, my dad had decided to take the risk to be among the fascinating cliffs of his family once more before venturing home. But the rains soon turned our admiring walk into a nightmare with nowhere to go but faster. We were out of control at the hands of the ecosystem, our bodies no different than the thumping rocks, logs, and sticks that would also be be picked up by the potential flash flood. Rangers in Capitol Reef say less than one half of inch of rainfall within an hour can cause a flash flood, and dry washes can fill with rushing water several feet deep. Seeing my family's fear in the wash, the fear that they couldn't that the fear that couldn't hide in my dad's royal blue eyes terrified me. As we foot swiftly walked after the rain started to fall and the mud got increasingly thicker, I declared how much I loved my family members something we didn't do often. I apologized for everything I'd ever done, for complaining about the adventures my dad wanted to take me on. I genuinely believed that we would not survive, that we would become a color on the sandstone. This was the first time I had feared being caught in a flood in Capitol Reef, but I had heard the stories of the people my dad's family knew who had died in the park's water. I had visited Capitol Reef every June of my life up until that moment and did four summers after. We went to, my, we went to visit my father's grandmother who lived in Moa, a town out about 30 minute drive to the park's entrance. I looked forward to that reunion all year. I recall running down small town streets adjacent to farms and fields of rocks with my cousins, 
coins bouncing in, bouncing in our pockets to buy grape sodas from a small Royals market. We spent hours at a section of the land locals called Big Rocks where giant orange boulders entertained us for hours. My grandmother grew up here, living the cowgirl lifestyle in the 1950s. She rode her horse everywhere, even into the park, and helped her family manage their farm. The first time I rode a horse was at her brother's farm near Tory, where bison grazed in the distance. Gatherings where my grandmother and great uncle sing original songs about life in the desert inspired me to want to learn the guitar myself. Their lives are shaped by the rural, unforgiving, and unpredictable nature of the environment. While in Loa for the family reunion, my family would spend hours in the park exploring the canyons and arches and uniquely shaped structures of all different colors. By the time I was eight, I had done most of the hikes advertised by the visitor, the visitor center and many that they don't. My father didn't care about difficulty. He wanted to show his children the world he grew up in, the land most of his youthful summers were spent. Often, we went, it was, often when we went, it was July and the blazing sun heated the red rock like a convection oven. Heat exhaustion is very common here. If not well prepared, one becomes dehydrated very quickly. Sometimes I wish to stay home from the hikes and relax at the motel pool or play at Big Rocks. But looking back, I will always value the time my family spent exploring the colorful canyons that echo the story of my family and the record of the Earth's history. Fortunately, my family reached the parking lot at the mouth of the wash before the flood could reach us. When we made it out safely, a rush of relief, one stronger than a bursting flood, washed over me as I sobbed and hugged my mother. We slugged through the mud, falling everywhere, to a road that we walked along for about 30 minutes to our car. The fragility of life was the topic of my mind during that miserable walk. Safety had always been a guarantee. I learned young to not rely on the idea that everything would work out. Nobody was safe. Five years before my family nearly washed away in that flood, we had taken a journey out to Capitol Reef, not in July, but in February, a week after my birthday. My grandfather, my father's dad, had abruptly died in his 60s the day I turned, the day I turned four, and he was to be buried in the Loa Cemetery. The rain fell hard during his funeral. Bleak, bleak drops of water drenched my hair as I watched his casket be lowered into the ground. Brisk air comforted me. After the morning, my dad drove my family out to Capitol Reef. The sandstone cliffs that pr and prickly cacti I had remembered seeing the July before were blanketed by the same snow as home. My dad drove us here so he could relieve, relive, relive the memories he had with his father, and I know I will do the same one day. And in, in any environment, water is a powerful erosive force, but in the desert, it is paramount. Over time, water is shaped to little hollows and raised tilted sandstone layers in the water pocket fold like a pa patient sculptor. This is where the fold gets its name from. Capitol Reef has shaped who I am just as its water shapes its majestic cliffs. Four years after our encounter with the wash, my family and I were driving home from a trip to California when my dad heard from my great aunts and uncles down in Loa that his grandmother was not doing well. When we crossed the Utah border, my dad asked if we could take a four hour detour to visit her. Selfishly, my brother and I, tired from being in the car for nearly nine hours, begged him not to. We didn't understand how much it meant to him. A week later, my great grandmother passed and I found myself back in Wayne County at the same cemetery I said goodbye to my grandfather at. This was the second to last time my family all went back to Capitol Reef together. The last time, my Aunt Nellie was lowered into the ground next to her dad, preserved in the town of her cowgirl mother, next to sandstone cliffs and desert lakes. Capitol Reef has always been a place of grief and change. It stores my family's history. One day I will return to bury my grandmother, maybe even my parents. Rocks at Capitol Reef record 275 million years of the Earth's history. Its bed beds of rocks show Capitol Reef encompasses a variety of ancient environments including open marine, near shore, river, lake, and desert. In its sandstone cliffs, I will always see picnics with my family that no longer exist. I remember riding horses across fields with buffalo in the distance. Here, there is open space and room to breathe. There is space to think. There is space to fear falling and drowning. There is space to fear death and to be okay with it. It is one of those places that makes me remember what being a human truly means. It's where sandstone cliffs full of history lie under stars that show the past clearer than I've ever seen. Anything can happen here in the flap of a hummingbird's wing. And I will always return to this desert when I need a reminder of what is most important. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna read a poem that I wrote in high school. Um, it's right. called Our Little Secret. Um, you came into my life and began feeding me lies. You fed them to me by the spoonful. I accepted, I accepted each bite as though it would nourish me, just like you said it would. I trusted you and believed the things you told me. You manipulated me and I allowed you to poison my thoughts. I never thought it possible for you to hurt me, but that was before I saw the monster that hides inside you. As I continued to accept your lies and drink your poison, I became extremely weak and had to rely on you for strength. For you had convinced me that I could trust only you, and that telling anybody about our relationship would result in unimaginable, devastating consequences. 
I receive dozens of messages from you daily, fabricated compliments and words of affirmation throughout the day, just so you could persuade me and butter me up for the requests you would send later that night. You absolutely hated the word no. I learned very quickly that the word was forbidden, despite how desperately I wanted to scream it. I never let it leave my mouth, for uneasiness must remain hidden. I was lost, alone, and utterly terrified. I was trapped and I couldn't find the key to my isolated, chilling cage. Still, I knew I had to do everything you asked me to do so I wouldn't have to bear the consequences of your utmost rage. You learned that my parents would be gone for the night and rushed immediately to my house. You betrayed your wife and left her home alone, anxious and worried that you still hadn't come home. As my 30-year-old uncle, you pinned my innocent 15-year-old self against a wall. My mind filled with confusion, yours filled with lust. Standing there in silence, I had never felt so small. As you grabbed my hips, my throat went dry. I couldn't scream or even make a sound. My heart racing, I stood frozen with fright. You whispered almost inaudibly, don't ever tell anyone about tonight. You forced yourself on me along with your touch. I pleaded for God to make it stop, but you still wouldn't get off. I shut my eyes tightly, wishing I were somewhere else, wishing someone would show up and help. I wanted to cry, but you didn't like tears, so I held everything in until you were gone and I could privately express my fears. Alone in my bed, tossing and turning, the, recur the recurring nightmares just wouldn't stop coming. I wanted to tell someone and finally escape, but your words continued to haunt me as they echoed through my head. Remember, this is our little secret. If you dare tell anyone, I promise you'll regret it. Okay, this is called Death and Beauty. It's kind of a poem about seasons changing and like a weird mythological origin story, I don't know. <laughs> Um, death and Beauty. The first winter, Death sat alone and frostbitten. The earth hibernated, hummed beneath him, but no life would touch him. At the peak of his isolation, Death felt the earth's core crack beneath him. Molten tendrils shot up from the burning core below, and suddenly, winter fissured. Death stood abruptly and shivered in shock, and jumped a mile out of his skin when a living hand touched his bitter shoulder. He whipped his head around to see who alive would touch death, and beauty stood soundly in front of him, ethereal and tangible all at once. Beauty thrust forth her hand and seized death by the throat, and with animalistic violence kissed him on his frozen lips. Without death's notice, winter fell into spring. Death took beauty in his suddenly fluid arms, and they waltzed across the earth all spring, as the birds and all the little things crept out to behold them. In the full heat of summer, they lays together in a lovesick haze, reclining in the sweet shade of the swaying palm trees as the waves kiss the sand at their feet. As summer waned, their love waxed stronger. One still, starry night, death snuck away from his sleeping beauty and scoured the earth for something worthy of her magnanimity. At first he despaired, as nothing seemed worthy, but as his palm filled with beautiful fragments of the earth, of jade, of seashell, of the smoothest river rock, he saw his beauty entwined in the togetherness of it all. So on a volcano's obsidian crest, he forged together all of his collected treasure into an exquisite band to fit his beauty's ring finger. When beauty woke, death knelt, stoic and shaking, and he didn't even have to ask. Beauty leapt into his arms and with the magnificent band on her lovely hand, embraced him. Deep in the luminous forest, their sacred vows were made in a ceremony attended by chittering forest creatures and witnessed only by the sacred heavens and stars above. As their rite came to its finale in the same moment that death and beauty became one, the earth burst into an explosive autumn. There was no longer death without beauty or beauty lacking death. All the magnificent withering leaves stood as testament, two ancient entities forever entwined together. We're nine out of 15 <coughs> people so far, nine from the classes I'm teaching right now, so we're doing really good. This is awkward. You certainly don't have to. Yeah. Would anybody like to read? All right, I brought a piece because I feel like I really did put a lot of pressure on my students to come, and they all showed up, and I'm so grateful for them. Yes. Um, but Joseph, can you turn the camera off for this? Yes. 
So this is able to have everybody here. Um, we hope to see you again in one week. Then students will be reading, and then you all can have a chance to read again. It's so wonderful to have this really uh, beautiful community of people. So thank you. Be safe, take care of each other, and yourselves. Mm -hmm.